Welcome back from the break. It is now the conversation segment, which is exactly that. I have a really lovely conversation with an amazing guest. And today I am going to be talking to a woman leader. Well, she's a woman leader in her own right, but actually she is a woman who advocates for women leadership. Can you guys ever see us with a Kenyan president? A Kenyan female president. Ooh. Anyway, I'm so excited for you guys to meet her. Let's go say hello. I am going to be chatting with Ruth Ambogo, and she is a lady that wears very many hats, but they are all really awesome, and I can't wait to get into women in leadership. Ruth Ambogo is a youth and governance policy specialist. She is also an up and coming lawyer, and she is the founder of an incredible new company that is called the Center for Advocacy and Awareness for Youth in Africa. Hi Ruth, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. It's a chilly morning to this morning. It is, but it's nice still all the same. Yeah. Um, Ruth and Bogo, very excited to talk to you. Um, went through things with my producer for this conversation and I was just looking at everything you've done and all the conversations you've had for women in leadership and I was like, wow. <laughs> I, I really don't think there's, there's, there's so much to it yet because I haven't, I haven't gotten to where I would like to get in life, but I can say that uh, uh, so far, so good. So far, there's so still far. a lot more to be done, yes. I love it. That's the spirit. Um, so we are going to be talking about women in leadership today. And how do we go about encouraging young women to take up leadership positions? And further still, what is the first leadership role you actually ever took? I would really want to know. Did you ever take up a leadership yeah. role in school? What was that experience like for you? Well, um, the very first leadership role I ever took up I think was in, uh, if, I, if I can remember way back, was in my primary school, which was a, a school called Rongo Success Academy, back there in uh, you know, uh, South Nyanza. And uh, I was the class prefect. And I remember as a class prefect, I always tell people this story that as a class prefect, because it is connected to my passion for law, mm -hmm. I would always find ways of defending people who are found uh, making noise. You know, the class prefect's role is technically supposed to be reporting the noisemakers. But for me, I do it differently that when people are found making noise and maybe the whole class is being punished, I would step in and become like sort of like their advocate of sorts. So I would okay. step in and tell the lecturer that, you know, we were either discussing a class issue or we were resolving something as a class. And then uh, what went, what ended up happening is that I kept on climbing up the ranks. And I think I became a head girl when I was still in class. Uh, what class was that? I was in class seven when I became the head girl, deputy head girl in class six, uh, head girl in class seven, and still continued with that position when I was in class eight. And then went to high school at Loreto Limuru where I took on now. And I think in primary school, I was also a leader when it came to music festivals, um, ah. you know, poetry. I'd always be the leader of poetry club or the music festivals bit of it, the singing, uh, the choir part of it. I always took up, basically in my life, everywhere I go and I'm, whenever I find myself in a group of people, there's always me being pointed out as the person who should either lead a program or lead a project. So in high school, I think my leadership skills became even a bit more pronounced because I was once again in choir and took up responsibilities within the choir uh, in the CU, I would take up responsibilities. But most importantly, I think all those, all those are just the foundation of my leadership. But the most important leadership positions I have undertaken were the ones that I took on at Strathmore University. Uh, mm -hmm. When I joined in to study my law degree, mm -hmm. where I actually ended up getting 100% scholarship and partly because of my leadership uh, in high school. You know, my, that my is high school amazing. Commended me for it. So. Um, I ended up now joining law school and as a CPA student, I led a program, rather I was picked on to lead a program that was called Elimisha Stratizen, which means educate a Strathmore citizen. So I was the one in charge of that program at some point and we were able to fundraise and, 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 and raise a lot of money to assist students. Then when I joined now my law degree in my first year of law school, 
I got uh, elected as, I think, the first ever person to be elected while in first year as a student leader, and I was elected as a public relations representative. And uh, that's yeah. how I catapulted myself into leadership. And here we are, where I have founded my own organization, calling itself Center for Advocacy and Awareness on the Rights of Youth in Africa. But even before that, I had founded back in 2016 an organization calling itself Young Kenyan Women Leaders, whose main aim, one of the main aims of the organization was to ensure that we see a lot of more women, and especially young women, being involved in leadership positions, being involved in leadership conversations, conversations about uh, the welfare of the nation and the welfare of the people, and ultimately have them join political uh, positions as elect, either elected members or as appointees. So um, it, it since moved and morphed into something that is more representative for all the young people. I like that. That is amazing. Um, you set up that organization in 2016 and you still have created another one for leadership. Uh, you've talked about um, being a leader even in poetry, music festival, when you were in school, and then you ended up um, taking up leadership positions in public relations and communications in university. When you left school or you were in university and you were out in the working world, did you find it more challenging for leadership positions? Uh, well, for sure, I will tell you that uh, things were not as rosy as I thought they would, uh, you know, as I thought they would be. One of the things that I realized when I started joining the, work, the working space is that, you see, when you're in school, you are a leader. When you are a student leader or even a youth leader out there, you're the one who ultimately makes the decisions. But then you walk into an organization where there's a leadership structure, there's a chain of command. There are people who you've walked in and the first thing that gets into their mind is that this woman is a strong woman, she has a strong personality, and maybe she's here to take over my job, or she probably could be appointed something, uh, she could probably get an appointment that I have been eyeing for years, and she's just Entire. walked into this organization. So uh, there were the, I, one of the challenges I have consistently faced in my work, uh, in my working environment as a young leader, and as a young person is that Number one, there is the intimidation that comes with you being a strong personality, that mm -hmm. I am already naturally a strong personality. So then I walk in and I find this environment where people are intimidated by strong personalities. People don't want people who talk. People don't want people who, uh, in, in, in a good number of, of places I have been to, not just necessarily work, but even the general life out of school and youth leadership, people get generally intimidated by women who are standing bold or rather myself who sometimes comes out as a very outgoing person but then i i equally find people who are collaborative of the same people who say this is the kind of energy i want and sometimes i usually say that those who are able to sit down and sift the noise from everything else and see the talent and the gift are the ones who, who are able to make good use of people like myself so the other challenge i face in in in, in the work environment is the chain of command again as I have mentioned, that you walk into an organization and suddenly you are not the leader there. You are below a good number of people. We are, you're below five or six other people or even two yes. or three people, or one person. And you want things done a certain way. You're so used to doing things seamlessly, but then that there are structures that have been put in place. So that is one thing that I have been learning how to deal with as a young person, not necessarily wishing it away, but learning how to understand that there are systems in place. Uh, but then again, also, finding ways of making these people understand that there are better ways and more efficient ways of doing things. Because when you find yourself in such an environment, the ultimate uh, result is usually a delay in action, a delay in, in running of programs, which is something that I personally, as a person, don't like. Yeah. No, yeah, that's true. Um, some organizations can have a hierarchy structure where if everyone is not working the same timelines with the same speed, a lot of things get delayed for no reason. Um, and you're 100% right. I have experienced that at work myself as well. Yeah. Um, we look at leaders, even in our country today, and there's more male leaders than there are female leaders. And what I want to know is, for a woman who today wants to go into a governing position in this country, what are some of the biggest hurdles that a woman is likely to face if she wants to go for an elective position in this country? Uh, well, first thing we must appreciate before even we talk about how we have lesser women uh, in elective leadership positions, 
we must appreciate how far we have come as a country in True. terms of representation. First thing that we need to realize and we need to learn or even get the facts of is the fact that in the last election that we had in 2017, we witnessed the highest number of women uh, leaders elected ever in the history of the country, True. whereby we had 172 women being elected out of the 1,883 uh, seats that were available for elections, which was a number that was up from 145 that were elected in, in 2013. So basically, we had an increase in the number of women that got elected to seats. And the reason that can be attributed for this particular in increase is because of the fact that more women put themselves out there to run for seats in 2017. And, and uh, a study was done by the uh, National Democratic Institute, NDI, and the Kenya the Federation for Women Lawyers, FIDA. And the study revealed that in the last election in 2017, 29% more women put themselves out there to run. So that is something that we need to celebrate. But before we go into the, and, and now at this point is when we can now discuss about what are some of the hurdles that women face when they are running for electives. It's number one, it is becoming very, very expensive to get party nominations. Party nominations, you know, paying for political party, party uh, paying to just be on that party nomination list in itself is it's a very so expensive fine. endeavor for most women you know so you find that uh, for various positions for governor positions you have to part with millions even to run for a senator within the internal party nominations within party political parties is a very expensive affair so the fact that uh, political processes are expensive for women in general is one of the concerns that a woman who is running for politics has to factor in before they consider running for it and uh, I hope that even as we move forward, we shall see uh, more organizations coming out and petitioning. And maybe mine will be part of the poll will be petitioning the political parties that just start to come up with you know, ways in which that they can lower the burdens for, financial burdens for women to run. Okay. Number two, there is the general uh, patriarchy that underlies within our society, where we have people who still strongly believe that women, the role of women is limited to certain spaces that are not necessarily leadership. So right. you're trying to run for a, for a political seat in a society or may, maybe in a background that tells you that a woman's position is not in government, a woman's position is not in a key decision-making uh, stage. Yeah. And so they, 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 they get you to positions such as uh, being the homemaker, being uh, the, the person who runs the affairs of the, of, of, of the husband, but never ever putting you or painting women in the light of that women can also lead. And this has been seen a lot with pastoral communities where you find uh, them holding the majority view that, you know, that women are not supposed to lead. We have communities in this country that ever since we attained our independence and had our very first elections to date have never elected a woman member of parliament and have zero plans of doing so. So the societal mentality that women, uh, certain because not all societies are like that. We've seen societies that have actually overcome that and even delivered to us first female governors. Kitui County delivered to us uh, a first female, a first, is it Makweni or Kitui? I think it's, uh, it's Kitui, yeah? Kitui County has delivered to us a first female governor. We had the late uh, Governor uh, Laboso who passed on. We have Nyeri County that has also delivered to us a governor. And, and basically these are communities that are proving to us that indeed, people can get to a point where they are saying, not only can a woman be a member of parliament or a member of county assembly as an MCA, but they can also run for big seats such as governor and win. And now we as women who actually form a great percentage of the population of voters, allow me to inform you that women form 51% of registered voters in Kenya, right. meaning that uh, if women were to come up and say, we even want to elect a female president, then we would actually have that happening. So we need to have societies that remember that at the end of the day, we can have female leaders, not just at the lower level of uh, positions of leadership, but higher positions of leadership as well. Let me also uh, remind, remind us that uh, we have countries that have shown us and proven to us that indeed we can have female heads of state and head of, heads of gov government. And by female heads of state and female heads of government, I'm referring to countries that have elected for elected women as their prime ministers and presidents. I'll give examples. Thailand having a prime minister, Germany having a chancellor, 
you know, Trinidad and Tobago having a president who is a woman, uh, Lutania having a president who is a woman, you know, the prime minister of Australia being a lady. And basically these are examples that we can borrow from that if more advanced countries such as those can be able to vote for women leaders, why not us? And I don't think that the argument that they are more advanced is what should prevent us from yes. saying we can also elect him, you know, electing leaders, heads of state. So the other challenges that women face is also the fact that there is violence, a lot of violence that takes place during elections. Um, I have heard stories of women who on the campaign trail tell you how they were either uh, violated, uh, they, 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 are, they were stripped naked, you know, when they were on the campaign trail. And as a result of that, they never want to be in on campaign trails ever. Some yeah. have been raped in the process. So the question becomes for women that who will ever enforce the security of women when they're running for campaigns? There's a psychological abuse that women go through where yeah. your sexual life is put out there, your family life, is she married? Who is she dating? Who is she having an affair with? And sometimes many of them allegations that cannot even be founded or are unfounded allegations. So basically there's so many hurdles uh, that women face to get into elective seats that if you see a woman getting into an elective seat, or even a nominative seat, then you really need to congratulate them. Uh, sometimes you find women who would wish to be nominated in political parties, but then what ends up happening is that massive bribery happens, and them who had been placed on, you know, party lists are usually, nominations take place based on the ranking, on where your name is on the party list. So let's say, for example, your name has been placed at number two for nominations. Uh -huh. Then the day of when the list of people who've been nominated comes out, you realize you missed out. But somebody who was a man who was number four on the list has been nominated from a political party, meaning they either went through means that you cannot go through to get nominated. So that okay. happens a lot in this country. Right. So there's very numerous, numerous, numerous challenges. Um, and obviously, we require a lot of support because, like you have said, registered voters are over 50%. For women yes. so obviously that means that if you have half um, of the population with a certain voting power it doesn't make sense to not have them so that's always yeah. the argument you know it's half of the population of the world of the country of the city so it makes sense for that half to have a say um what i want to know is if half of um registered voters obviously being women why is it that when we are at the ballot making a vote as women we can be biased against ourselves. So as a woman, I do not want to vote for another woman. Where does that come from? Well, first of all, it comes from the mentality that has been placed upon us as women, that women are our own enemies. I find it as a fallacious statement that is put out there. I find it as a fallacious statement that is usually thrown out there to make it look like women cannot uh, stand for themselves. So the moment somebody starts telling you, women are their own enemies. You, you also live up with that mentality, knowing that, you know, registering it in your mind that women are their own enemies. Then you get to the ballot paper. You know, you get it into your mind that we are our own enemies. You get to the ballot paper or the ballot box and you decide that, you know what, I was told we are our own enemies or I was told this and this about this particular woman. So I will end right. up not voting for them. I attribute it mainly to us being brainwashed, especially as women, being brainwashed to believe that our fellow women are bad, our fellow women are not good examples to the society. They don't, they will not stand as better leaders as opposed to the men. And yet, when you look at the kind of work they do, the kind of work that some of these women leaders do cannot even be compared to members of parliament who, especially the nominated women, cannot be compared to members of parliament who have been in parliament for such a long time. So I think that we need to change that mentality. We need to break that mentality that, uh, you know, women are our own enemies and break the mentality and also get to listen to these women and ask them, what is your agenda? Because once you know what somebody's agenda is, then it's very hard to dissuade you from saying that, oh, you know, this person, it's very difficult for somebody to come and sway you and tell you this person stands for this when you actually know what agenda they believe in. So I think we, I, I would call out to the society to, before listening to what someone says that is negative about a woman who is in a leadership position or seeking a position of leadership, mm -hmm. to find out who is this woman what does she stand for? What work has she done in the past? And yeah. Yeah, what is her agenda and what is her focus? Um, and yeah. does this woman have goals for the country, for her county? And exactly. what does she look like? Yeah. She will actually be able to achieve them. Um, 
Yeah. yeah, I think that's usually the most important thing to look um, for if you're voting for anyone. It should actually not have anything to do with gender, but unfortunately, as we can see with lower numbers of women, it is. Um, so before we finish up, I want you to talk to young people who want to be leaders and aren't sure about how to go about it or are very scared. What advice do you have for them? Uh, one thing for the youth, because uh, my organization represents the youth in general, the Center for Awareness and Advocacy, rather Center for Advocacy and Awareness on the Rights of Youth in Africa. Uh, one thing I would tell the young people is that for leadership, for you to become the leader that you want to be, you have to start somewhere. You can't wake up one morning and suddenly you've been nominated. It has to be a track record of what your work shows and represents. That's what do you stand for and what do you believe in? That at the end of the day, if we are to look at your work five years back, can we see a pattern of a young person who either believes in education for all or a young person who either believes in youth participation in governance or a young person who believes in uh, the provision of, 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 of particular certain rights, the right to access water, the right to security for young people. So start somewhere and have an agenda that is very, very clear. And by starting somewhere, I mean go for, you know, find a mentor in the political field. Join organizations as volunteers such as my organization. Center for Advocacy and Awareness on the Rights of Youth Africa. Join us and ask us, ask us, what kind of programs can I be a part of? And then again, plug into, you know, register for these programs that train people, especially the young people, on how to be leaders. Register for yearly, the, especially the Kenyan chapters, the East African chapters, before you can even think about the bigger yearly. So what, what I would advise younger people is that we need to begin somewhere and start somewhere, that your foundation is what matters more than anything else, your foundation matters. That by foundation, I mean, where are you starting from? Who is holding your hand? What values are you believing in? Do you have consistency as a young person? Yes. Do you have an organization that you can be linked up to? And do you have programs and projects that people can say, this is something that was started in the name of this young person? Right. Then at that particular point, again, I would advise you, join a political party because you cannot purport that you want to be nominated or you want to be elected as a leader in a political party and yet you are not even joining that political one. party, True. you know? So join a political, identify a political party that matches with your values and your views, one whose leader espouses the views and, and beliefs that you, be, that you believe in as a young person, or one whose manifesto and constitution has things that you believe in as a young person, and join that political party. And don't matter where you're starting from in a political party. Whether you're starting as the person who registers people, or as a person who goes around uh, mobilizing for membership, Start somewhere and eventually, with consistency and hard work, you are definitely going to end up where you ought to be. Thank you so much, Ruth. That is amazing and incredible. I feel motivated as is. <laughs> I don't even know if I want to be a political leader, but I will go and introspect and ask myself, um, what is it that I need to do? But I like what you said. It's really just about starting somewhere. Yeah. Um, and from there, you'll figure out your journey. Ruth, could you kindly share with all our viewers your social media pages where they can find you and how they can also register with your organization? Well, uh, first thing is that you can find my social media accounts at Ruth Ambogo on Facebook. Uh, if you drop me a message on Facebook, I'll be sure to respond. Uh, Ruth Ambogo on Twitter as well. On Instagram, it's Ambogo Ruth. But the most important one for me is my organization's uh, account, which is Center for Advocacy and Awareness on the Rights of Youth Africa. Center for Advocacy and Awareness on the Rights of Youth Africa. You can reach out to us by sending a message. Our team will reach out to you to find out how exactly you'd want to be either a member or a volunteer. Amazing. Thank you so much. I hope that there are young people that have listened to you and I today. Through this conversation, um, I've had an amazing time talking with you. I really appreciate you making the time for this interview. Thank you so much. Um, goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. All right. You too. So that was Ruth Ambogo. She is the founder for the Center of Advocacy and Awareness for the Rights of Youth in Africa. And you might be wanting to be a leader or you've never known how you can contribute to your community here in Kenya as a young person. And guess what? There's so many organizations just like her that exist that help you to do so. I want to reiterate something that Ruth said um, here for Sura's Cut. 
And one thing that she said is, as a young person, if you want to go into leadership, as a woman, as a girl, if you want to go into leadership, you need a track record before you're put into a leadership position. So whatever it is you feel you're really passionate about, leading is actually about doing the work. And she said, you find out what you stand for, and then you start putting in the work to do it. So volunteer with organizations, register with a political party, and that way you can start making the change that you look forward to having in Kenya and in Africa as a whole today. I'm Susan Jiroge. This is Conversations. You can talk to me on my social media on Instagram at Sura underscore Common, on Twitter at S underscore, and on Facebook, Sura Common. This has been Conversations. Now we will go on to the audience segment and some TikTok videos.